Welcome, friends. Um, thank you for watching the, um, the channel. Today I'm uh, speaking to you about an important topic which is called intestinal uh, fistula. Now, intestinal fistula is a rare surgical problem, but it's very really essential uh, part of the element of surgical uh, education. We all need to be aware of it and know how to manage it. First thing we need to know what a fistula is. The fistula is a false track or a communication between uh, two epithelialized surfaces. And in this situation, uh, the skin is epithelialized surface and also the gastrointestinal tract is epithelialized surface. And that runs from the uh, mouth to the uh, anus. So fistula can happen anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract. But we today are focusing on the intracutaneous fistula. That is the fistula that... Uh, uh, happen between the small intestine and the skin. Majority of these happen after complex abdominal surgery, particularly if it involves removal and reconstruction of few organs or a trauma laparotomy. Sometimes inflammatory bowel disease, and that's uh, usually uh, Crohn's disease, can lead to a spontaneous fistula. And the, patho the pathogenesis of forming a fistula in any situation of this is that there is defect in the wall of the small intestine that lead to uh, leakage of the uh, enteric content uh, adjacent to that area, which will lead to abscess formation. And that abscess formation could either f lead to peritonitis, where the patient will need to have a laparotomy, or remain uh, localized, and eventually it will work its way up and discharge its content toward the skin. And with that, it will continue to discharge enteric contents on the skin, usually at the wound of the operation. Another reason for that to happen is the uh, mesh that surgeons apply to repair ventral hernias. It mesh is a foreign body, proline based, and it can uh, invade the small intestine and that can lead to a fistula uh, months after the repair of the hernia usually. So how do we get that? We get it either uh, we miss uh, a, a small bowel injury at the time of the operation or the patient has uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, as we said, complex abdominal surgery and missed enterotomies, um, and sometimes delayed and a somatic leak. And also in penetrating uh, uh, abdominal injury when there is severe trauma, patient comes in, in a morbid situation with blood loss and multiple organ injuries, uh, it is uh, every now and then possible to uh, miss an injury that occurred to the small intestine and uh, uh, if we don't repair it, it will lead either to eventually peritonitis or localized form of abscess formation and eventually a fistula formation. How do they present? The patient will uh, present with a fecal or enteric content coming on the skin or discharging through the skin, usually at the site of the incision of the previous uh, operation. So that would be their main uh, contents. And the consequences that happen following that is they become dehydrated with uh, loss of electrolytes, uh, mainly sodium and potassium, and that can uh, lead to acute kidney injury. But also they become malnourished, they lose weight uh, because they are not getting enough uh, uh, nutrients. And the other problem is the skin excoriation. Enteric contents are very uh, corrosive to the uh, skin, so we need to protect the skin when we treat uh, this type of fistula. What do we do to the patient apart from uh, examination, examining the patient, taking the history of uh, their uh, recent surgery or no recent surgery? Uh, and what medications they are on and their general medical condition, just the same cliche that we do for everyone. Uh, and then uh, usually we get a CT scan of the abdomen. And the purpose of the CT scan of the abdomen is not only to determine the fistula, but also to uh, investigate the anatomy of the uh, abdominal uh, organs, to uh, which can detect uh, another abscess, can detect a missed foreign body, and it can look at distal obstruction. So CT scan is 
uh, essential to uh, the to the investigation of intracranial fistula. Uh, another form that we uh, need to do is fistulogram, and the fistulogram will help us to confirm the connection between the skin and the small intestine, and also it can function as a uh, measure to see how far. Uh, down the length of the small intestine the fistula was. And there are two types of fistulogram. One of them is a fluoroscopy and the other one is a CT scan. A CT scan uh, these days is more uh, available and uh, uh, used often uh, in these situations. Now, we need to manage these uh, fistulas once we have diagnosed them, and the management uh, relies really on how much output is coming out of, of the uh, fistula. And then we divide them into a high, high output fistula, low output fistula. High output fistula usually is a proximal in the jejunum, and low output fistula is usually uh, distal toward the terminal uh, island. Now, there is an arbitrary cutoff as for the volume to define the uh, fistula. If it is uh, 500 mil or more per 24 hours, then we consider it as a high output fistula. If it is less than that, it will be a low output, uh, output fistula. Low output fistula can be managed uh, uh, outside the hospital, but high output fistula should be admitted to the hospital uh, because they need more forms of uh, treatment. And these patients who are the high, uh, with a high output fistula, the first thing is uh, we need to uh, rehydrate them in the usual uh, manner, manner and correct their electrolyte, the sodas, and then we feed them. And the feeding uh, is going to be uh, usually parental TPN uh, form of uh, uh, feeding. Uh, and that will provide them with the protein, with the calories, and, and we rectify this protein calorie malnutrition. Also, they get vitamins, uh, iron, and trace elements. Uh, often, they are anemic and they might need a blood transfusion. They could have evidence of uh, uh, sepsis often, and uh, there might be N uh, drain collections. Then we have to address that with antibiotics and CT guided uh, uh, drainage. Uh, we mentioned the renal function that has to be uh, corrected and treated really well. There are other uh, uh, stuff that we can use to uh, ma help to manage the fistula is uh, the infusion of octreotides and proton pump inhibitors. Now, octreotide work, by the way, that it reduces the blood flow to the gastrointestinal tra tract and hence it reduces the secretion uh, that the small intestine produces uh, and that will reduce the fistula outputs. Uh, proton pump inhibitor work in a more or less uh, uh, a similar way. They inhibit the acid and also they reduce the uh, general gastric secretions. So the uh, aim of these two agents really is to reduce the intraluminal secretion of the gastrointestinal tract in order to reduce the quantity of the output from the fistula. These patients will usually be uh, null by, by mouth. Uh, and that happened for the proximal fistula, while if they have a distal fistula with low output, we can feed them and uh, uh, look after them in an ambulatory way outside the hospital by uh, more or less the similar measures, but they need to drink plenty of fluid with electrolytes, we, they can have oral antibiotics, they can have dressing to the uh, fistula, they can have a, a drainage or an abscess if there is one, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, now we usually fistulas will uh, heal and the time frame for uh, healing is quite uh, uh, variable and also depends from one center to another and from one surgeon to another. Uh, and that get, uh, get us to the um, phenomena of a persistent fistula. What do we mean by a persistent fistula? Um, any fistula that doesn't heal within six weeks is a chronic long-term fistula. And then we have to think about the causes, what leads to the fistula not closing uh, spontaneously 
with the usual treatment measures. There might be some anatomic problem, uh, like distal obstruction or a, a, an abscess that's still drained in the abdominal cavity. Hence, the CT scan would help us to, to do that, particularly if you do it with an oral contrast. Uh, it will show you if there is a, uh, a, uh, a distal obstruction uh, in the small intestine. There are rare forms of infections that can lead to uh, persistent intestinal fistula, so we will need sometimes to get culture from the uh, discharge and uh, treat the uh, infection appropriately. We should suspect malignant processes if the, heal, if the fistula does not heal, and that would be very unlikely to apply to the small bowel, but it will be more relevant to a malignant process in the large bowel, as adenocarcinoma is more common in the uh, large bowel, but still we should think about the possibility of uh, malignancy. A previous radiation. Patients who have previous radiation um, for cervical cancer or uh, prostate cancer, and particularly those who live for a long period of time, they get delayed damage to the uh, small blood vessels that supply the uh, intestine, and that can lead to uh, multiple strictures uh, and distal obstruction, and that uh, tend to be a, a particularly difficult problem to uh, deal with. As we say, distal obstruction, if that happens, we will find about it on CT scan and oral contrast, and we will treat that usually uh, surgically. The presence of foreign body, very unusual, but it does happen every now and then, and a CT scan will show you that, which means that we will have to take that foreign body uh, out. And the last one is when the uh, fistula has got a very short tract, like the uh, uh, loop of the small bell is sitting directly underneath the skin through a, an incisional hernia, then the fistula get uh, uh, epithelialized, the whole tract is epithelialized. And uh, if that happens, it doesn't heal without surgical intervention. Uh, but such a scenario is rare. Well, friends, that was a short topic, and um, I hope it has been informative uh, for you. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm always available for you to uh, discuss. Uh, these issues and uh, ask me uh, questions uh, about any issue that's not so clear to you. Thank you much and I will see you in the next uh, recordings.